I'm here at the University of Minnesota exploring the soul of Western civilization. The DNA of the Western civilization was written in the universities and monasteries in Europe. Now the universities have rejected the ideas that created the modern West. Therefore, in a series of lectures, I'm exploring if the sun must now set on the West. Thank you all for coming. If you were in California with the kind of rain we have had today, we would probably have canceled the event. But I appreciate <coughs> the spirit of Minnesota, <coughs> which isn't intimidated by uh, this kind of rain. The lectures that I gave here five years ago in 2002 were uh, entitled The Heretics, the People of the Book that Created the Modern World. Since then, I have written out my thesis in a 400-page book, and the book is called Must the Sunset on the West? An Indian Explores the Soul of Western Civilization. So although the slant is futuristic, must the sun set on the West, uh, what I'm really doing is looking at the force that created the modern Western civilization and also globalized uh, what was essentially a Western civilization. I will be looking at the soul and I will be arguing the overall thesis that the sun need not set on the West. A renewal, a revival, a new awakening is possible, desirable. But without, without that renewal, the sun will set. I'm reminded of um, George Orwell's quote. This is in 1940, having seen the First World War, experiencing the Second World War, the horror through which Europe is going. He wrote, for 200 years, we had sawed and sawed and sawed at the branch we were sitting on. And in the end, much more suddenly than anyone had foreseen, our efforts were rewarded and down we came. But unfortunately, there had been a little mistake. The thing at the bottom was not a bed of roses after all. It was a cesspool full of barbed wires. It appears that amputation of the soul isn't just a simple surgical job, like having your appendix out. The wound has a tendency to go septic. If the West chooses to amputate its soul, the sun will set. But that choice is not necessary. That's, that's the thesis. Today, in this lecture, I want to use music as an entry point into the soul of Western civilization and look at two icons of Western music, Bach and Cobain, to try and see this picture of the sunrise and the glory of the West and the decline of the sunset. In 1994, an electrician discovered a body above a garage in Seattle. The police investigation concluded that this was the rock legend Kurt Cobain, who had killed himself, blown up his head with a shotgun in unrecognizable bits. His uh, beautiful wife, uh, the singer Courtney Love, she had called the police a few times earlier to have them confiscate his guns his, before he hurts himself or hurts others. And his other attempts to kill himself with overdose of drugs had failed. But this time, both he and Courtney Love were actually in a rehab center in California. And he slipped out, went to Seattle, and killed himself. Uh, and nobody knew where he was when he was discovered. Once, once the new, news spread that Kurt Cobain had killed himself, there were at least 68 copycat suicides. His fans 
started killing themselves uh, all over the world, including Australia and Europe. And that was because he was a powerful uh, figure. His album, Never Mind, uh, sold 10 million copies and displaced Michael Jackson uh, from number one position in the charts. And according to the industry, he is number one dead artist, which means that after his death, he has sold more albums, or his albums have sold more uh, than even Elvis Presley and some of the other great uh, musicians of our day. He is an icon of the contemporary Western civilization, and in some ways, he symbolizes the setting sun. This fact of suicide is something which is new in American experience. Uh, Diana Grains of Rolling Stone, uh, she writes that in the 1960s, suicide was practically unknown amongst the young people in America. But by 1980s, almost 400,000 adolescents were attempting suicide every year. By 1987, suicide had become the second largest killer of teens after car accidents. By the 1990s, suicide had slipped down to number three because young people had begun to kill each other as often as they killed themselves. Now, this is tragic because these uh, young people in the 1980s and 90s were the children of the generation which chanted in 1960s, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has to go. The, the chant began in Stanford with uh, Jesse Jackson joining the young people. They were idealists, and there's no doubt that many of those people were sincerely disgusted with the hypocrisy which they saw in their parents' generation. They were seeking utopia, but their rebellion against what they saw of uh, America didn't quite result in the utopia that they sought. So Diana Grains of Rolling Stone writes that the 1980s offered young people an experience of unsurpassed social violence and humiliation. Traumatized by absent or abusive parents, educators, police, and shrinks, stuck in meaningless jobs without a livable wage, disoriented by disintegrating institutions, many kids felt trapped in a cycle of futility and despair. Adults effed up across the board, abandoning an entire generation by failing to provide for or prepare them for independent living. Yet when young people began to exhibit symptoms of neglect reflected in their rates of suicide, homicide, substance abuse, school failure, recklessness, and general misery, adults condemned them as apathetic, illiterate, amoral losers. Now, She's right, but she's obviously superficial. The problem is much deeper. Cobain understood his generation much better and reflects, is a legitimate icon of his generation. His album, the most famous album, was called Nevermind, and his band was called Nirvana. But the phrase Nevermind means don't bother. Don't concern yourself with something. Now, why should you if nothing is really good, true, or beautiful in any absolute and objective sense? Why should you be excited or dedicated to something if nothing is really uh, true and good and beautiful? Should one really be concerned? Should one give himself? to nation building, to future, to the poor, or anything. The idea of never mind as a virtue, you know, the apathy, is a very logical value and virtue 
if you are a nihilist, if you don't believe that there is something out there that gives meaning, value, significance to everything here. Cobain had an adorable daughter, he loved her, but should he be concerned, should he be bothered about the fact that this uh, young child, as she is growing up, would need a father? Should he be concerned about his wife? Should he be concerned about his own life? But if there is nothing out there, no one out there who gives meaning and significance to himself, to his wife, to his marriage, to his child, he doesn't need to be bothered. Now in that sense, I will argue that Cobain was a lot more honest, and this is where, uh, th this is partly what explains his popularity. He was a lot more honest even than philosopher like Sartre or Camus, the French existentialist, who also believed that there is no God, therefore there is no meaning, there is no purpose, there is no significance to anything. But you can create meaning for yourself by your choices. There isn't any objective truth, there isn't any objective beauty and meaning or value, but you can create your own meaning and value by your own choices, by authenticating yourself. So the existentialist didn't quite live by their own value, by their own belief system, by the core of what they affirm is the ultimate truth about reality, that nothing has any meaning and value and significance because the universe is all that there is. There isn't a God, there isn't a creator who gives any meaning and value to anything. But Cobain, even by killing himself, demonstrates that he lived by what he believed. Now the word nirvana, which was the name of his band, is a Buddhist term for salvation, which means cessation of existence, extinction. Buddha, for very good reasons, rejected the Hindu idea of God. There were too many gods, they were too wicked, not worth following, just like Greek gods and goddesses. So Buddha rejected the idea of God. And he understood, even more profoundly than Nietzsche understood 2,500 years later almost, that if there is no God, and in fact Nietzsche didn't quite understand this, if there is no God, then you as a self, as a soul, cannot exist. What Nietzsche did understand was that if God is dead, if we have killed God, then all the civilizational fruits that came from our belief in God in Europe, those fruits are unsustainable. But if God is dead, everything that flowed from our faith in God, then those things are also dead. They have no meaning, they have no value. What Nietzsche didn't understand was that if God doesn't exist, you can't exist as a soul either. Psychologists like uh, Freud and Carl Jung, they talked a lot about self, but their truly secular followers are recognizing that in fact their uh, discussion of self was simply what they brought from their Christian heritage. Jung's father was a clergyman. Secular psychology is now a discipline in decline because all the astute psychologists understand that you can't really do psychology without theology because psyche cannot exist <clears throat> if God doesn't exist. What you have is an illusion of self. You think that you exist and that illusion causes misery. There is nothing permanent, there is no eternal immortal significant soul. So that illusion causes uh, uh, misery and salvation on nirvana is to get rid of that illusion that you exist as a soul, as a conscious being. Now the deconstructionists in Western universities, they believe that language creates the illusion of the self. But Buddha understood that it is much deeper than the problem of language 
it is in fact mind that creates the illusion of self, uh, because if there is no God, then the ultimate reality is ignorance. There is no logos out there, there is no logic, there is no reason out there. Uh, so ignorance is the ultimate reality, and everything devolves or evolves out of ignorance, including the mind. And because mind is a product of the ignorance, it creates the illusion of self, and then search for salvation becomes trying to destroy or get out of the, your sense of existence. So one of Cobain's lyrics is, if I may uh, quote, it goes like this, silence. Here I am, here I am, silent. Bright and clear, it's what I am, I have died. Death with violence, excitement right here, died, go to hell. Here I am, right here, oh, death is what I am, go to hell, go to jail, die. Now, this was a view of salvation as extinction, as death, and that's what he was seeking, and his fans followed him in that, and he remains popular because he lived and died by what he believed. A lot of nihilists don't live uh, by what they think. What is interesting is that Cobain's musical genius blossomed in a culture which was very different. You know, Americans take music for granted. The fact is uh, that the American musical culture is unique, it's peculiar. Uh, last year or two years ago, Turkmenistan was uh, the latest country to ban music on television, in all state functions, in general assemblies, even in weddings. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, uh, America occupied Afghanistan, they don't have music. A woman cannot sing even on radio where her face is not visible, let alone on television. You can't go into any mosque anywhere in the world and find an organ, a piano, a guitar, or orchestra, or band, because Islam con considers music as haram or illegitimate. But it's not just Islam. Although Cobain became a Buddhist and called his band Nirvana seeking a Buddhist uh, salvation as extinction, cessation of existence, the reality is that his own experience had taught him that life is suffering. You know, it was easy for him to accept Buddha's first noble truth that life is suffering because his parents divorced when he was just nine years old. His childhood was apparently happy, normal, but by the time he was nine, home had become a battlefield, a verbal battlefield between his father and his mother. And his mother started dating younger men. His father was more concerned about losing his new wife than losing Kurt. And this rejection by his parents so deeply affected him that he was never able to find a, an emotional, social, intellectual center for his own life. And it made it easy for him uh, to accept uh, Buddha's first noble truth that life is suffering. And by definition, that means that it's not possible to have a life without suffering. The only way to end suffering is to end life, and that's what he attempted. This philosophy that life is suffering, this world is a wheel of suffering, birth is suffering, living is suffering, death is suffering, does not allow one to really celebrate life. You can't sing joy to the world because you have to get out of this world to end suffering. Buddhist philosophy was powerful. You know, they developed 
lot of scriptures, developed sophisticated psychotechnologies to not only silence your words, which Cobain is singing about, uh, singing about, but also to stop your thoughts, stop thinking, techniques like vipassana, which have become very popular. So it developed a lot of sophisticated philosophies, sophisticated psychotechnologies. Buddhism originated in India and disappeared in India, but uh, while it was there for 1500 years or so, it acquired tremendous political patronage for long periods of time, built huge monasteries, uh, great statues and caves and architecture and buildings which still survive, and they are part of our uh, treasured national heritage in India. But it didn't develop a tradition of music. No Buddhist monk uh, started a, a band called Nirvana or a choir called Nirvana. There is no musical instrument in India which uh, is distinctly Buddhist uh, from that period because while they had sophisticated chanting system, they had no interest in music because the worldview, uh, their belief that there is something to really sing about, to celebrate, that wasn't there. Some contemporary Buddhist temples now do have music because the, when Western converts came into Buddhism in the last <coughs> uh, few, several decades, then they brought their Christian tradition, grafted it uh, onto Buddhism, so like people like Kurt Cobain, but traditionally it doesn't. So it's not just the Muslim cultures or the Buddhist cultures that couldn't develop the tradition of music. The question really is, what made the West a uniquely musical and optimistic civilization? That's what we want to explore. What made the West a uniquely a musical and optimistic civilization? Now, music is obviously written into the very structure of the universe. It is physical, you know, you can't take uh, any string and get any uh, note out of it. The string has to have a particular thickness, particular length, particular tension to get the note that you want to get. You are, in a sense, not creating music, but discovering music, uh, which is there in uh, nature, built into, uh, coded into the physical structure of the universe. And it's part of what human beings are. So the music existed um, thousands of years ago in Iraqi uh, civilization in the temples in China. Uh, before Buddhism reached there, there was music in the temples. Boys and girls will uh, sing as yin and yang in uh, temple rituals. So there is always music, even if your philosophy, your worldview cannot make sense of music. And it's not just uh, Islamic or Buddhist worldview that cannot make sense of music. Um, a naturalistic, evolutionary worldview cannot make sense of music because evolution has to assume that music evolved from animals. But the unfortunate fact is that none of our so-called evolutionary cousins make music. Some birds do sing, but no one has proposed that we evolved from birds. Darwin thought that Music evolved as an aid to mating, but no rapist ever takes a band uh, to woo his victim. And rape, in evolutionary terms, is a perfectly natural form of mating, because evolution has to rule out not just music, but also morality. It's something artificial which society imposes upon people. It's not part of nature. The fact is that the music serves no biological function, no biological purpose. It is an evidence of the fact that human beings are more than biology, that we are spiritual beings. It is part of our spirituality that we make music. Now, that is what St. Augustine 
wrote. The DNA of the Western civilization was really written by St. Augustine. Augustine wrote six books on music. First five books are technical, which a Greek philosopher could have written. His sixth book on music is a biblical philosophy of music, which is quite the opposite of the outlook of Cobain. You know, as Cobain is experiencing this pain and suffering inflicted on him by the generation of the 60s, by his parents' generation, and he is experiencing that life is suffering. He has tremendous success as a musician, fame and money and sex and drugs and everything, rehabilitation programs. None of them really satisfies, none of them gives meaning to his life. Because you need something infinite to make sense of anything that is finite. St. Augustine was then able to give meaning to music. The, the meaning to music came from the overall framework that an individual must love God with all his heart, mind, and soul, and love his neighbor as himself. That framework, that these are absolute values, and they have implications which are directly opposite to never mind, uh, they, they imply always mind. If I'm to love my neighbor as myself, which means that I should always be concerned about his welfare. And if I'm to love God <coughs> with all my heart as his friend, then I should always mind uh, his honor and his concerns. So the never mind and always mind were two opposite uh, philosophies of life, which is where in his sixth book on music, Augustine uh, finds meaning for music. He says that music is bodily, is physical, but because it is mathematical, it's rational, it's logical, it is eternal, it is permanent, it is significant, and it is made by soul. And if you rule soul out, as I said, uh, then you can't really make sense of music. So, it was these Augustinian monasteries during the Middle Ages and schools that cultivated that basic philosophy of music because August, St. Augustine essentially was the one who wrote the curriculum for education for Europe, which dominated Europe for almost a thousand years with modifications as it went along, but it was essentially his curriculum. Initially, Christian music was very simple chanting, but by the 11th, 12th century, in, particularly in Paris and Notre Dame, it began to develop, as we now know it, as a complicated rational music which could be written down. So if you've never heard it before, you can play it and you can sing it in different parts, different instruments coming in at different times, but beginning to make beautiful harmony. Now, the man who took this Augustinian uh, philosophy of music to the masses uh, was Martin Luther. Martin Luther is a polarizing figure. Some people love him, some people hate him, but most people would agree that he was perhaps the most important uh, figure of the last 1,000 years uh, who helped create the modern world. He took this uh, philosophy of music out of the cloister, the monastery, uh, to the masses because he discovered in the New Testament the idea of the priesthood of all believers. Earlier only the choir sang, uh, the professionals uh, worshipped and performed music, but everyone was supposed to sing and praise God and worship God because everyone was a priest. So he moved the music and worship from Latin to German and wrote, uh, translated not only the Bible into German, but also a German hymn book, and then began to create music. And he insisted in the reform of the education. For him, the reform of the university was the second most important need besides the reform of the church. And in that, uh, in education, 
uh, he had strong, very strong proposals for uh, education. Maybe I should just read one statement from him which is necessary to understand Bach because Bach was a product of um, Lutheran education. Luther wrote, I've always loved music. Whosoever has skill in this art is of a good temperament fitted for all things. We must teach music in schools. A schoolmaster ought to have skill in music or I would not regard him. Neither should we ordain young men as preachers unless they have been well exercised in music. So in his whole scheme of education, music became very important. That's why all the traditional universities respect music even today a lot more than the secular universities that were founded in the 20th century. You know, not many Americans realize that cities like Oxford and Cambridge are not just university cities, they are cities of churches and chapels. The most important building in a university is a chapel, and the centerpiece of most of these chapels is a pipe organ. Now, how the Augustinian uh, philosophy contributed to the development of pipe organ is very interesting, and we will talk about it when we uh, consider the topic of uh, technology. But before the invention of the clock, pipe organ was the most complex machine which was an expression of the development of technology in Christian monasteries, which were dedicated for the love of God, glory of God, worship of God, and also for the love of human beings, a technology that would emancipate human beings from drudgery. The musical tradition which uh, grew in the Roman Catholic Church didn't grow in the Orthodox Church. Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church, mainly because Augustine didn't have a whole lot of influence there. So they continued at a very primitive level of music. The Protestant tradition inherited Roman Catholic uh, view of music. The Protestant contribution was to make it universal, make it open to everyone, make education available to everyone, make music available to everyone, because everyone is a priest, everyone must worship. And that received a tremendous boost with the Wesleyan movement, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, the, in the English speaking world, the uh, Wesleyan movement really uh, was a musical movement. And then in America, it was the Puritans who wrote music into the DNA of America. Up to the 1950s, uh, the music, even the secular music, was really driven by the biblical worldviews. Even Elvis Presley is singing a lot of gospel. Uh, it is biblical music. So secularization of music uh, at a mass scale is a very recent phenomenon. Although today's generation thinks that music is secular, it's our invention. But it is really the Bible that made the West a musical and optimistic, joyful. So Augustine's teaching through Luther created the environment in which Bach was born and nurtured and grew. Bach's home in Germany is just five minutes walk from where Luther lived as a student and about 10 minutes drive from, uh, to the castle of Wartburg where Luther hid for 18 months or so, translating the New Testament after uh, 1522. That whole area by the time Bach was born had become Lutheran, and he grew in this uh, worldview which saw music as bodily but made by the soul for the glory of God and for the love of our neighbors. The important comparison between Bach and Cobain is that both of them lost their parents at the age of nine. Cobain's parents divorced, Bach's parents died. Death of one's parents should have had the same kind of impact on that little child as Cobain's loss of parents had on him. He experienced suffering. All of these people experienced, they knew life as suffering. Augustine was writing when the Roman Empire was falling apart. Luther was writing and living in hiding as a fugitive 
because his life was in constant danger. They knew evil, they knew suffering, but the difference was that they had a faith <clears throat> that there is someone out there who cares. He is almighty. He can, he is not only created, but when his creation has become corrupted and uh, evil, full of suffering, redemption, restoration, triumph is possible. So, Bach's life, his mind was saturated with the Bible, which was the source of his music. His works are just filled with Bible. That biblical worldview, the fact that the creator is a compassionate and powerful savior, he can redeem. That death can be overcome, there is resurrection, is possible, is real. That enabled him to celebrate the passion. The passion means the suffering. The passion of St. Matthew or the passion of St. John. He could celebrate because God is there and his salvation is free. This is what Luther had discovered. Uh, what is there really to sing about? Now, I like using a little parable from India. Uh, there is a little town called Rajpur, has a king and a prince, so the only car that is there in town. The prince is being driven by his chauffeur through the town, and suddenly a lame dog uh, comes in front of the car. The sh chauffeur swerves and breaks and stops and is worried what happened to the dog. The prince jumps out of the car to see. People recognize that this is Prince's car, so they all come running uh, to try and see him, but he's interested in the dog. He sees this lame dog and asks, How did what happened to his leg? So people say, Well, you know, <clears throat> these stray dogs they fight, and uh, people, some people feed them, so they follow everybody, others kick them, stone them, and beat them with sticks or throw boiling water at them. Uh, who knows what happened to this one? You know, what's his name? Someone giggles and says, well, the stray dogs don't have names. Uh, another one says, well, people call him the lame one. So the prince is angry. He says, okay, I'm going to rename him beloved. I'm going to take him to my estate, look after him, heal him. His offspring will live in my state, grow up in my state. I will discipline them then nobody will mistreat them. They'll be my friends, I'll be their friend. Now what can a stray dog do to get adopted by a prince? Nothing. Luther discovered that that is what salvation is. That we are lost in an awful world, but the creator loves us, he's compassionate. Abraham was like that stray dog. God chose him, invited him to become his friend, enter into a covenant relationship with God. That you follow me, you walk in my presence, I will bless you, I will bless your descendants, they will be great, and through you I will bless all the nations of the earth. This is grace, amazing grace. When Luther understood it, that yes, there is suffering, there is evil, there is fall, but we can enter into a personal relationship with God. Life now has meaning, life now has possibility. There is hope for redemption, and it doesn't depend on my ability, but it is a free gift of grace, and that is something to sing about. That's how that <clears throat> whole culture created uh, songs, not just like joy to the world, but come all you faithful, joyful and triumphant, or amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. 
this is very much a box definition of music that uh, music is harmonious euphony for the glory of God. Now, uh, Rolling Stone had uh, an interview with Bono last year, the lead singer of U2, and he makes this point again that he sees music as something spiritual. Some of the contemporary music like gospel is running toward God, and he says some of the contemporary music like the blues is running away from God, but God is in the center of the jaunt. And he's right that even biblical poetry is not all praising God. Job and many of the <clears throat> Psalms of David and others in the, in the book of Psalms are questioning God because injustice is real, evil is real, and it's terrible. And if God is sovereign, if God is good, if God is almighty, why does this exist? The point is, uh, which Bono is making, is that even blues, when they are running away from God, rebelling against God, protesting God, condemning God, they are affirming that it is God who gives significance and meaning to everything in this universe, including our sense of justice that if God wasn't there, then nothing is just or unjust. You don't even have a right to raise that question. It's, it's just your feeling. All that you're saying is that I don't like it. That's uh, okay for you. What if I like it? So if I like taking up a gun and shooting people in the University of Minnesota um, and kidnapping girls, raping them, if I like it, uh, that's my fun. <clears throat> why do I have to be bound by what you like? Is there something good and bad in itself in an absolute sense, in an objective sense? And that becomes a spiritual question. And it is in that sense that um, there are several facets to our personality which only make sense if the universe is in fact a spiritual uh, entity more than matter and more than material. This whole tradition of music, which was written into the DNA of Western civilization, Cobain inherits the musical tradition, but loses the soul, loses the philosophy. And therefore, music is now an anguish scream, abuse shout, hateful, vengeful. It doesn't give hope, it cannot give hope because there is no basis for hope. There is hurt and the music doesn't heal. Success doesn't heal, fame doesn't heal, money doesn't heal, everything is meaningless. So the question is, what made the West a uniquely musical and optimistic civilization? And very briefly, what I've proposed is that it was this biblical worldview that the life, ha life has meaning. There is hope. We can be redeemed because there is a savior. This is what created a uniquely musical civilization. There was something to sing about, someone to love, someone to worship, someone to praise, someone to thank, someone to relate to, with faith in progress, redemption, recovery, restoration, which is now lost. The sun must set unless that soul is recovered. Thank you very much. These lively interactions with students, faculty and community at the University of Minnesota have reinforced my faith that there is no reason for the West to amputate its own soul. A recovery of faith is possible and desirable. The sun need not set on the West. <laughs>